Hello, and welcome to our Making and Meaning series. This is session three, Family Ties, Artists Exploring Kinship, Bloodlines, and Chosen Families. This program is presented by Margaret Lejeune. My name is Donald Hyatt. This program is presented from Rochester Public Library, Arts Division here in Central, Rondell. And thank you for all of us. Thank you for joining all of us today. Margaret is an image maker, educator, and independent curator originally from Rochester, New York. She holds an MFA from Visual Studies Workshop. Her creative practice examines art, science, and plant-based research. Uh, in 2023, she was named Woman, the Woman Science Photographer of the Year by the Royal Photographic Society. She currently serves at the as the Barstow Artisan Residence at the Central Michigan University and as a member of the Board of Directors for the Society for Photographic Education. And with that, I will read this to Margaret. And thank you so much for joining us all today. Thanks, Don. I'm really excited about our presentation tonight. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, Family Ties is a, a sort of personal um, interest of mine. I grew up with a really beautiful family. Um, and when I was a young teenager, my parents told me that I was adopted. And recently, in the last five years, I have met my birth parents, and I now have a wonderful relationship with them as well. And so I have a, a um, sort of a whirlwind family story of my own that I love to share with people. And today we're going to look at a lot of different artworks that um, show a variety of different family structures. So family means chosen kinship, blood ties, sometimes lifelong bonds and the perpetual renegotiation of boundaries, regardless of how much fondness and affection are involved. The American family has long been pictured as the nuclear family, right? The husband, the wife, the children, perhaps a pet, living in a single family home with a picket fence. We all know that sort of tagline. This social imaginary, as I'll call it, was constructed through government policies regulating marriage rights, immigration restrictions, and property rights. It was also reinforced by photographic and media representations. Yet our actual lives are so much more expansive than this limited vision of families and homes. We are all part of a family, sometimes only on paper, sometimes as a community that's made up of friends who are we devoted to over years or decades or even our lifetimes. Communities play a key role in today's world. They are crucial to our decision-making and help us to mold who we are and shape the way we think, feel, and act. They make us feel protected, seen, appreciated, and understood. The chosen family is depicted in many ways in photography and art, and I'm going to show you some of those in this presentation. As we view these works today, I'd like you to think about your own experience documenting images of your family, both blood and paper related and chosen. What images do you cherish the most, right? How were those images created? Were they posed? Were they candid? Do you plan a yearly photograph to document changes over time? Do you hoard images of moments that can, you know, you're concerned you will lose? Do you avoid taking pictures of some family? Have you ever burned or defaced an image of a family member? And why are these images so important to us and what stories do they tell? So I'm opening with a little humor today. <laughs> We've all seen these um, stickers on the backs of cars. Uh, as the notion of the nuclear family and the ideal family model fades, many new ways of thinking about togetherness and community have arisen. Consider one of the ubiquitous trends found on many minivans and vehicles beginning in the mid aughts. The family sticker, uh, family stick figure sticker, they are called. This trend of displaying your family makeup or your family values became wildly popular in about 2006 and has since grown to include many forms of family units and are often display, often display how one is um, maybe not part of a traditional nuclear family. Consider the examples I've shown here, the cat lady on the bottom right with her dozen plus feline friends, the image on the top right advertising an open position in the family, or the image on the left proudly displaying a couple of dinks, uh, double income, no kids with all their money. These stickers are just one way we visualize and in some cases proudly claim our family ties through art. 
Let's now take a deeper look into images of family and kinship in carvings, paintings, photography from art history. We'll start in ancient Egypt and move our way to the contemporary, considering how and why family have been immortalized through art. Please keep in mind that the meaning of art must be considered in context. When, where, how it was made, who commissioned the works, and even where it was installed. Context changes the cultural shift, shifts such as changes to religious values, um, economics, views on property, gender roles, and many other factors. Um, discussion on nuclear families, single parent families, foster and adoptive families, step families, gay and lesbian families will all be included in this presentation. So we're gonna begin here now with the famous altar relief showing Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti and their three daughters underneath the solar disk of Aten. The tips of the sun rays are shown as hands extending symbols of life toward the royal couple. The features of both king and queen have been drawn in a newly exaggerated style, which has become, to, uh, which was known as the Armana style based on the location where this style sort of grew in Egypt. Traditionally, rulers were depicted as being both useful and handsome in order to document the power of their kingly state. Akhenaten and Nefertiti distanced themselves from this ideal and had themselves portrayed more realistically. Um, and even during their early years of reign, ill-favored, some would say, maybe a little hooch of a stomach or extended chin, something of that sort. Um, a no less extreme break with tradition is representation of the daughters, with heads which are elongated at the back as a manifestation of life-giving power of the sun god. This representation, together with the character-like overdrawing of the faces, is a purely stylistic device and is not an indication of hereditary or intentionally produced deformities. Nefertiti and her husband were known for their radical overhaul of state religious policy, in which they promoted the earliest known form of monotheism, Atanism, which centered on the sun disk and its direct connection to the royal household. With her husband, Nefertiti reigned at what was arguably the wealthiest period um, of ancient Egyptian history. The exact dates when Nefertiti married Akhenaten and became the king's great royal wife are uncertain. They are known to have had at least six daughters together, and it's likely that Nefertiti was elevated to co-regent status upon Akhenaten's death, and she ruled Egypt until Tutankhamun, who most of us are familiar with, uh, the boy pharaoh, ascended to the throne. The nuclear family was core, you know, I'm going to use that word, nuclear family, even though it's a contemporary word, um, of the Egyptian society, and many of the gods were even arranged in such groupings. There was tremendous pride in one's family, and lineage was traced through both the mother's and the father's lines. Respect for one's parents was a cornerstone of morality, and the most fundamental duty of the eldest son, and occasionally the daughter, was to care for his, his or her parents in their last days and in to ensure that they received a proper burial. Okay, um, this is a, uh, an example of a family scene from ancient Greece. It's a red figure vase. And um, the, the gynecium, which is a room, uh, a portion of a house that was reserved for women is what we're looking at here. It was generally in the innermost apartment. Um, in other words, this was the women's quarters, so to speak. Um, and it was the place where the married woman of the household would often join with unmarried women and female slaves at night when her husband didn't join her. The women spent most of their days in this area of the house, and these worms, rooms were more remote um, from those that were reserved for the men. Uh, they were kept away from the streets and the public areas of the house. So when visitors were entertaining or were, were entertained, the women were not present, but they remained in this secluded area. And in, in this period of time in ancient Greece, children often lived with their parents until they got married. The birth of the first child was a very important event. The child was showered with attention. Um, it was used to be, uh, you know, ancient Greece was a very male dominated society and public life was reserved for men and the home was the area reserved for women. Um, 
And, you know, it was a patriarchal structure that was rather rigid, um, but it was seen as essential for maintaining order and stability within the household and by extension, their communities. Um, so women, while operating in a more private, private sphere, played crucial roles in ensuring that the household functioned smoothly. Their responsibilities encompassed domestic chores, raising children, and often managing the household finances. The bond between the husband and wife, though often born out of societal obligations and economic considerations rather than romance, could also be one of mutual respect and affection. Children, too, were also held in a very high place. Um, their upbringing and education were of paramount importance, and they were seen as bearers of the family's um, legacy and honor. So moving forward a little bit, um, we're now going into uh, another uh, classic Rome or, um, uh, you know, ancient Rome. And this is a tondo from, it's called the Berlin Tondo. It was from about 200 AD. And it's one of the most well-preserved examples of panel painting from classical antiquity. And it depicts two generations of Imperial Severn dynasty um, who were members of the Royal Empire in the late second and early third centuries. And so we see a husband and a wife and two sons on this disc. And one of the son's faces has been deliberately erased. Um, this was a, there was a, a, a phrase called the condemnation of memory is how it translates into English. And it indicates that a person has been, excuse me, excluded from all official accounts. Essentially they've been removed from their family. So we see this figure on the bottom left-hand side, and we see the wife and the husband on the top and the other son on the bottom right-hand side. This is a work on, uh, that's created with tempera paint or an egg-based painting, and it's on a circular piece of wood panel, which we call a tondo, and it's about 30 centimeters across or roughly 12 inches across. Um, the family is wearing really sumptuous ceremonial garments, and the sons were holding sons, and um, uh, Severus was holding scepters in their hand. They were, you know, showing their wealth, showing their riches. Um, Julia, the the wife, is shown wearing a customary wig from Roman society. Um, and she is shown with paler skin than her husband, but these are probably not true depictions of their complexions. The, you know, colors have faded and changed over time, and sometimes these were just artistic choices uh, that the painters would use to depict women with fairer skin and men with darker skin. Um, so this painting, you know, it's very similar to the Fayum mummy portraits. It's a very similar style to that um, in terms of the way in which the paint is applied, the way the figures are rendered, um, and even the kind of jewelry and attire that the family is wearing. Moving on to the medieval period, um, the me medieval household was more like a modern household. The center of the family life, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> um, you know, it, it consisted of many more individuals than our current nuclear family. The household, <clears throat> from the household of the king to the humblest peasant dwelling, more or less distant relatives and varying numbers of servants, and dependents would cohabitate together with the master of the house and his immediate family. I'm just gonna grab a glass and drink of water. <clears throat> the structure of the medieval household was largely dissolved um, by the advent of privacy in the early modern Europe period, in, in early modern Europe. The idea of privacy that we have now was something that you know was really changed and constructed during that period. Um, and there was much more um, sort of freedom of movement in the house between people who were not blood related. Life was much harsher during this period with you know limited food, very little comfort. Women were subordinate to men in both peasant and noble classes. They were expected to ensure the smooth running of the household. Their children had a very low survival rate of only 50% beyond the age of one. By the age of 12, a child would begin taking on more serious roles to help out with family duties. And although um, 
Canon law said girls could marry at the age of 12. This was relatively uncommon unless the child was an heiress or belonged to the family of a noble birth. Um, peasant children at this age stayed at home. They continued to develop and learn domestic skills and husbandry. Urban children moved out of their homes into the homes of their employers or their masters, um, depending on their roles as servants or apprentices. Noble boys learned skills in arms. Noble girls learned basic domestic skills. And the end of childhood and the entrance to adolescence was marked by leaving one's home. And like I mentioned, moving in with the employer or the master, perhaps entering school or university or entering into church service. Um, so yeah, these are two examples. On the left-hand side, we have um, an image of a family uh, perhaps making and preparing cheese together. Um, and on the right is a table that is about bloodlines. And this was from about 1200. And this was showing um, like how a brother and sister-in-law may be related, the degree of kinship between an individual and their blood relations. These tables followed an established tradition dating back to around 600 AD. And until church law was relaxed in about 1215, a marriage could only be contracted between persons separated by seven degrees of relationship. After 1215, that degree of separation was reduced to four. So these kind of bloodline tables were really important to be able to prove or disprove if a marriage could take place. Okay, this is one of the most famous paintings in the world and a painting that has intrigued me for quite a very long time. This image is by Northern Renaissance painter Jan van Eyck and it's entitled The Arnolfini Portrait. In it, we see a richly dressed man and a woman standing in a very private room. And although it looks like it's painted in a real room exactly as van Eyck saw it, every object has been very carefully chosen to per proclaim the, the couple's wealth and social status without risking criticism um, for aping the uh, aristocracy. So the, the house is of brick, um, its windows open to a garden, uh, a cherry tree can be glimpsed through the open shutters. There's a large luxurious bed that is covered in very expensive red woolen cloth on the right hand side of the image. Red cushions and fabric are scattered on the bedside chair and the bench behind the couple. This is not a bedroom, even though we see a bed in it, but it's a reception room. And the bed, which was usually the most expensive piece of furniture that uh, would be in a house, is essential to that, to that area of the home at the time. The chair and the bench are very ornately carved, and there's this gorgeous brass chandelier hanging from the ceiling. Even the careless scattered oranges that we see on the windowsill indicate wealth. This fruit was extremely expensive. But this is not a palace. The floor is boarded. The walls are plastered rather than paneled or hung with tapestries. And we're looking into a reception room uh, in a comfortable modern mansion of a wealthy merchant. The clothes are expensive and fashionable, but they're not flashy for the time. And the woman wears a fine green wool overdress with elaborate sleeves and a long train, which she pulls up around her belly. And some people have assumed that she is pregnant, but she is most likely not. She's just holding the bulky gown in front of her as ladies commonly did in portraits at this time. Her hair is made up in this fashionable but modest horn uh, uh, updo and it's held in place with red nets and it's covered over with this intricately um, laced veil. So who are the people in this intimate setting? Well, there's a husband and wife, clearly, clearly. And for many years, this was understood to be a marriage ceremony, though that's not what our historians think anymore. The Arnolfinis were an extensive family of Italian merchants and various members lived in Bruges in this period. The most likely candidate for this portrait is uh, Giovanni Arnolfini. He would have been in his late 30s um, in 1434, the year that this was painted. The lady is probably his second wife, whose identity is not clearly known. In the background of the image, we see this very large round mirror. Um, it's convex glass, and it compresses and contorts the room, but in the mirror, we see a lot more information. 
we see two men coming in the door. The first man is raising his arm and stepping down steps. And immediately above the mirror, we see a very flamboyant signature, which translates to Jan van Eyck was here in 1434. So perhaps the men in the mirror are van Eyck himself and his servant arriving for a visit. So even though the room is not literally a record of the couple's home, we do get the sense of their their wealth um, and the things that were important to them. Um, so if you look closely, there's astonishing amount of details in this image. You can see the oranges reflect in the polished wood on the casement of the window. The beads hanging by the bed cast shadows and reflections on the wall. And the men's patents or his, his overshoe coverings you can see in the foreground. Um, and there's their little dog in the foreground as well. A dog in a portrait at this time would again been another symbol of wealth because it was another mouth to feed. Okay, moving forward a little bit into the Renaissance era, I chose this image of the chess game or a portrait of artist sitters playing chess uh, because I really love to talk about the work of um, Sofonisba and Gasola. She was uh, 23 years old when she painted this work and she signed it. Uh, you can see on the front of the chessboard, it says her name and virgin daughter painted from, from life, her three sisters and a maid in 1555. It's painted in a beautiful garden setting. Um, and Lucia, the third born of the Angiosola children is moving a chess piece. Um, she is sitting in front of Minerva, who is the fourth born child, who is reacting to her chess adversary. Uh, she puts her arm up uh, as if she's saying, you know, you can't do that. <laughs> she attracts the attention of her younger sister, Europa, who is the fifth born, um, who is following along behind the game and kind of laughing. And then we have a fourth person in the scene as well. And this is most likely the housemaid. And there's a clear contrast between the younger rich women right, and the elder common woman based on the clothing that they are wearing, um, you know, the jewels that they are wearing, the elaborate hairstyles, where the servant is shown in very simple attire and we see the wrinkles on her face. The picture takes place in a domestic setting. It's circled with, you know, these friendly figures, but there's a competitiveness of the game that's happening as well. Uh, in the garden, we see an old oak tree growing um, behind them uh, that is you know, growing with branches. And that's a symbol of the solidarity of a family relationship. And in the very background, we see a light blue landscape, which was painted in the Flemish style with that atmospheric perspective giving us depth. Okay, another very famous painting about a family is Las Meninas. Um, this is uh, a, painted by Diago Velasquez in 1656 in the Spanish Baroque style. It hangs in the Prado Museum in Madrid. And this is was referred to in early inventories of paintings as La Familia or the family. It's become one of the most widely recognized images in Western painting. It has a very complex and enigmatic composition, and it raises a lot of questions about reality and illusion um, and this um, sort of relationship between the figures in the painting. So what we're seeing here is the royal court, essentially, of King Philip IV of Spain. And there are many figures in here that seem to be captured in a snapshot rather than in a painting, right? As if a particular moment has been captured. It's a really stark divergence from traditional royal portraiture. And some of the figures look out on the canvas toward the viewer while others interact amongst themselves. In the center of the image, we have the five-year-old Infanta Margarita Teresa. She is surrounded by her entourage of maids of honor, a chaperone, a bodyguard, um, two dwarfs, and a dog. And behind them, looking out, Velasquez portrays himself working on a large canvas on the left-hand side of the image. And then in the background, we see what is perhaps a mirror reflecting the upper bodies of the king and queen. They appear to be placed outside the picture space in a similar position to what the viewer would be. Although some scholars have speculated the image is a reflection of the painting that Velasquez is actually working on. 
The notion of extended family is quite palpable in this work, as the, compos the composition shows the helpers to the small princess. Though the parents are close by, she is quite comfortable with her entourage entertaining her, perhaps while her parents are sitting for a formal portrait. All right, our next work is another um, group, family dynamic, family group together. Um, this is the family of Charles IV of Spain um, and his family, and it's painted um, uh, by, by Francesco Goya. And this um, was painted in 1800 or 1801, um, shortly after Goya became the, the chamber painter to the royal family. Um, this was definitely modeled on the painting we just looked at, Velazquez's Las Marinas. Um, by setting the royal subjects in a naturalistic and plausible setting, he was trying to make the, the family feel more relaxed. Um, however, they are still dressed, you know, very garishly with all of their pins and awards and sashes and um, their really beautifully detailed gowns and such. Goya kind of, though, seems to have an aversion to flattering the family. Um, we see a ruddy faced king, right, sort of a pink faced king. Um, and we see the queen turning slightly to the side and she looks almost a little beakish. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting to think about the artist's take on the family dynamic when we're looking at a portrait like this. We see Goya, just as we saw Velazquez, painting a picture on the left-hand side of the image. But what's really different about this work is this condensed sense of space. In the Velazquez image, we have this very long room where there's a lot of spaced out um, you know, distance between the entourage and the foreground, the painter, um, the sort of guard who's coming in through the back door, where here all of these family members are pushed right up against the front of the image, you know, almost against what we would think of as the glass, right, in front of the scene. Um, Goya really seems to focus his attention on three of the figures. Um, one of the princes who is um, uh, dressed in blue, the mother, uh, Queen Mary, Louisa of Parma, who stands in the center, and King Charles IV. Although this is a family informal portrait, there's an indication of intimacy between the family members, even though they probably were not all painted at the same time in the same place. Goya probably did studies of each of the figures and then constructed the scene um, at a later time. Um, so this is, uh, you know, two really interesting examples of the way that royal families could be depicted. Um, we even have one uh, of the sitters whose face is totally turned uh, facing backwards. And that's probably because she was betrothed to be married into the family, but was not yet in the family. And this was <laughs> Goya's way of sort of protecting the family going forward in case that marriage did not work out. Okay, moving even more into uh, closer to contemporary times, this work here is um, the Bellelli family, and it was painted by Edgar de, uh, Degas uh, sometime between 1858 and 1867, before his more well-known phase of Impressionism. It's currently housed in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, and it was definitely a masterwork of his youth. Um, in it, he's painting a portrait of his aunt, her husband and their two young daughters. And this work um, really shows the artistic training that Degas had. He was um, traveling to Italy quite a bit during this period. And while he was there, he decided that he would have the opportunity to uh, work with his extended family and do a portrait of them. So this is the Baron uh, Bellili and their daughters, um, Giulia and Giovanna. Although it's not known for certain when and where Degas executed this painting, it's believed that he did studies as well as I was talking about with Goya, and that he completed this work when he returned to Paris from working in Italy. Um, Laura, his father's sister, is depicted in a dress that symbolizes mourning for her father, who had recently died and appears in a red line drawing that is um, framed behind her on the wall. The Baron was an Italian patriot who was exiled from Naples and he was living in Florence. 
we see him with his back to the spectators sort of peering out the corner of his eye, making him feel very closed off and aloof. Um, you know, in contrast to that, his wife feels dignified, her gesture trying to connect the family together as she puts her arm around one of her daughters and seems to sort of reach out her hand to her other daughter. And meanwhile, the husband feels very separated from the family, even with the, the edge of the desk sort of seeming to separate them. So this picture is really monumental in size. It's a simple composition. It's very sober. The colors all work really well to create this sort of sense of oppression, though, in the family. The figures seem restrained, as if determined to put on a good show for this family portrait, yet there's an unspoken drama that seems to play out between the husband and the wife, even. As they turn their heads to look toward one another, they don't actually make eye contact. This is, of course, the subjective viewpoint of a young and a young visiting relative. Nevertheless, one would suspect that Degas didn't have that much fun staying with this branch of his family. Okay, and in the early 20th century, we really begin to see a growing body of imagery of the non-elites, right, the non-nobility. Um, with the uh, investigation and development of photography in the mid 19th century, portraiture begins to take on a new life in terms of its relationship to painting. No longer are paintings needed as documents of family history, as the photographer can now capture an exact likeness. This work by Egon Schiele shows an expressive use of brushwork, color, and movement to capture his imperiled family. The family, as this is, is uh, titled, was painted in 1918, and sh this is shortly before the painter, his wife Edith, and their son, who are all portrayed here, succumb to the Spanish flu. This painting is the fruit of love between the artist and his wife, Muse, whose union was the result of an impetuous love at first sight, in which this happened in 1914, she lay, broke off another previous relationship to be with Edith. The serenity that she brought to his presence in his life really led him to move his work forward. Um, he used to depict really tormented and suffering bodies to some more intimate and composed themes. An example of this is The Family, a painting in which the artist's ideal family is immortalized, but projected into the future. In fact, at the time of this painting, Sheila's son was still in his mother's womb, though he depicts him here in front of Edith on the floor. It's important to emphasize how this work, despite the family theme, is able to convey the omen of the drama of the Spanish flu, transmitting a feeling of melancholy and suffering given by the bodies, restless, tired, full of emotional tension, the atmosphere of dark tones that we see, um, the anatomy suffered and gazes lost in this sort of dark void. In fact, the, it is only the artist who is looking out at us as the viewer, as if he wanted to communicate all of this weight of this destiny that he is known is about to be fulfilled. Okay, moving forward, we're going to look at a work by Frida Kahlo. Um, this painting is titled My Grandparents, My Parents, and Me. And Kalo is, is shown as a naked little girl holding a loop of red ribbon that represents her bloodlines. The ribbon supports her family tree. Um, it's effortlessly supported. The ribbon just seems to flow up into the space, almost as if her family were balloons. Um, you may wonder why the ribbon has a loop and why the loop is placed exactly where the parents' bodies overlap. The artist put a hint about this as we see a fetus can be seen in, an, in sort of x-ray vision under the wedding dress of her mother. Um, this is Frida Kahlo as, her, as herself before she was born. So the red loop might refer, might refer to her mother's sex life, um, since just under the fetus, there's a bunch of sperm seen swimming through the ribbon's loop to an egg that is fertilized. Also, the fertilized egg is next to a red cactus flower that is open, and some windblown pollen is, is coming off of it. 
So settled in the cloud puffs in the sky, we see Frida's grandparents, and they are recognized as Mexican and German. Um, and we see them um, being symbolized, Frida's parents are symbolized by an image that she took from their wedding photograph. She mentioned that she was, um, she looked like both her mom and her dad. She said that I have my father's eyes and my mother's body. She felt very lucky in that perspective that her mother had a beautiful figure with a wasp waist and her father had these large eyes and looked very intelligent. Frida put herself in the position uh, right in front of her father, standing there naked um, within the building structure that is at her feet. And the painting that she made of herself here looks almost identical to what her father looked like as a child. So this is a really beautiful image. There's a lot going on in this scene. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a couple of photographs now. Um, give me just a second here. This is the famous um, migrant mother from Dorothea Lange. Uh, this was photographed during the Great Depression and it really epitomizes the sort of desperate circumstances many families found themselves in during this period. This is now an iconic photograph that was made um, by the U.S. government's resettlement administration. Um, it's been renamed the Farm Securities Administration, or FSA, in 1937. Um, and this was a federal agency that sent pho photographers out to document uh, the sort of plight of urban and rural poor in the 1930s. The photograph's pictorial strength and emotional impact combined with its reoccurrence in newspapers and magazines and exhibitions and displays really cemented its place in America's collective memory. What we see is the 32-year-old migrant um, farm worker, um, Florence Owens Thomas, or Thompson, excuse me, and three of her children. And they're depicted huddled together in a tent in a pea pickers camp in California. Lang's taught composition um, of her face really shows us the essential information we need to know. You know, she is very concerned about what the future holds for this family. But the SFA, FSA photographers often um, didn't include a lot of information about the families that they were photographing. There was a lot of an, um, uh, anonymous um people who were captured at this time. So the next image I'm going to show you is a little bit in contrast to this kind of work, but also shot during the same period. Uh, another image where we see a woman with her children, baby on the lap. This is Gordon Park's dinner time at the home of Mrs. Ella Watson from 1942. And what Parks was asking is to what degree were the depicted individuals allowed to determine how they were presented in front of the camera? Parks was very concerned about this and he spent a long time getting to know Watson and her children. You may know the famous image of Watson standing in front of the American flag um, holding uh, a, a mop, right? That very famous iconic image is also of this family. So in both cases, we see the woman and she's flanked by her small children. And, you know, Parks really wants to avoid this anonymous feeling. So he starts to play with the ways in which photographs can interrogate space, the ways that they can, you know, talk to us about the fact that we are documenting something, that we are capturing a particular moment in time. And he does this so successfully in this image by incorporating the depth that we see of the family on the left-hand side, but also the history of the family. We see the other woman sitting on the bed reflected in the mirror. And then we see what is probably the grandparents or great-grandparents uh, in the photograph that we see uh, on top of the bureau. Okay, we're gonna move forward and we're gonna talk about contemporary depictions of family and kinship and chosen families. Um, if you could give me just one minute, I need to pause for just a second.
Okay, I'm very sorry about that. We were having some power issues here and I thought that I might lose all of you for a second, but we are back. Okay, okay. the first work we're gonna look at here is by Jess T. Dugan. Um, her creative practice centers around an exploration of identity, particularly gender and sexuality. Through photography, video, and writing, um, she Jess is really drawing from their experience as a queer, non-binary person. Their work is motivated by an existential need to understand and express themselves to connect with others. Their intention is to create work that facilitates intimacy and encourages empathy, understanding, you know, critical conversations about identity and contemporary social life. As they pursue these aims, Jess continues ex uh, to explore what it means to live authentically and how visual representation, particularly photographic portraiture, can play a powerful role in that process. Dugan says that their work does not attempt to provide any definitive answers, but rather it invites viewers to engage with others in an intimate and meaningful way, requiring them to reflect on their own identities in the process. The project that we're looking at now is called Family Pictures, and it beautifully depicts three generations of Dugan's family. And I'm just going to read you a quick quote here. While these photographs are highly personal, they also address the broader lack of representations of queer families in society. Unquote. Dugan shares intimate moments between immediate and extended family members, lovers, and children. And here on the left-hand side, we see Dugan with their mother. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we see um, Dugan's two uh, mother figures. This work asks the viewers to consider what makes a family a family and who gets to decide who can be in a family together and how we label what is love. Our next artist explores notions of identity, stereotype, and the family dynamic. Uh, this project is called The Lambs of Ludlow Street and is an investigation into the life of one Chinese family living in New York City's Chinatown neighborhood. This is by Thomas Holton. And growing up in New York City, Holton watched most people regard Chinatown as simply a tourist attraction and a weekend destination to go get dim sum and cheap counterfeit goods. His, his sort of quote about the place. Um, while he never lived in Chinatown himself, his grandparents did. And he knew that Chinatown was more than stereotypical images seen in travel brochures and postcards. Holton is half Chinese himself and spent a considerable amount of time in Chinatown, but never experienced a bond or connection to the neighborhood or the culture. He said that he had always felt like a visitor. At the beginning of the project, Holton knew he wanted to get behind closed doors and photograph more than stereotypical images of Chinatown's street scenes. While accompanying a local housing advocate for several months, Holton met the Lamb family uh, on one of his home visits. He returned several times to their home to photograph and Shirley and Stephen were always very friendly and welcoming uh, of Holton into their home. He increasingly began to participate in their everyday family rituals and to recognize the dynamic and relationships within this family. He went to their weddings, he helped with their food shopping, um, he went to their children's school, and eventually he even traveled to China and Hong Kong to visit their relatives. We live in a culturally complex world where cultures mix and influence one another either subconsciously or deliberately. There are no universal life plans. And as Holton became closer to the lambs, he recognized elements in their lives that he shared. He wondered, will I ever know what it means to be Chinese? He decided for himself that the answer is no, but he can attempt to understand how a single Chinese family might live through spending time with them and making photographs with them. The next artist um, creates work that focus on community as family in light of a serious environmental justice issue. In 2016, artist, uh, activist, and MacArthur Genius awardee, Latoya Ruby Frazier, spent five months living in Flint, Michigan with three generations of women, the poet, uh, Shay Cobb, her mother, Renee, and daughter, Zion. 
observing their day-to-day -day lives as they endured one of the most devastating ecological disasters in U.S. history, the water crisis in their hometown. The artistic result of Fraser's time there is reflected in this work, uh, which is called Flint is Family. In 2014, if you're not familiar with the Flint water crisis, um, as a cost-cutting measure, the Flint City Council switched the town's water supply from a Detroit treatment facility to an industrial waste-filled Flint River. Forced to consume and bathe in water contaminated with lead at 27 times the government's maximum threshold, Flint citizens, predominantly Black and overwhelmingly poor, fell ill almost immediately, and many battled chronic medical conditions as a result. By portraying those daily struggle of the Cobbs family, Frazier uses a tight focus to create a story about the impact of a systemic problem disproportionately affecting marginalized communities. Citing the doc uh, social documentary work of Gordon Parks, um, uh, which highlighted the social and economic effects of racism and segregation as an influence, Frazier rejected the voyeuristic photographs that emerged from outside media sources about the Flint water crisis and instead collaborated really closely with her subjects um, in making photographs together, capturing very intimate moments, along with a myriad of challenges that families faced without access to clean water. This series records the stories of surviving and thriving, especially within these marginalized neighborhoods in Flint, to ensure that they remain visible in national debates concerning environmental justice. Next, we're gonna talk about Brooklyn-based photographer, Charlie Ingman. Ingman, excuse me. Um, he was born in 1987 and he's been shooting portraits of his mom, Kathleen, since 2009. These really striking portraits of the artist's mother are shot in a variety of surreal scenes. Sometimes she's nude, sometimes she's dressed in a furry red jumpsuit, uh, sometimes she's shot in the photographer's studio or in a field on the side of the road. Initially, he just naturally started taking pictures of everything around him as a young photographer, including his parents. But then he noticed that his mother seemed to change in front of the camera. His mother was becoming a person he couldn't recognize in his own pictures. And this observation led to a long-term artistic project where he creates pretty daring, you know, composite portraits of his mother. They are both intimate and quite provocative. He sometimes represents his mom in settings that have little in common with our conception of a mother's everyday reality. We can see her posing in a, a bright yellow wig with blue eyeshadow and a fiercely challenging look on her face, or climbing a rope ladder fixed to a tree while wearing white underwear. He tries to work playfully and call into question what it means to make images of mother and motherhood. Uh, the next artist that I'm gonna show you is Pixie Lau. And these are really beautiful, intimate um, images from a series called Experimental Relationship, in which the artist presents herself with her partner in a variety of staged situations. The couple switch between different modes at different times, sometimes very serious, other times really humorous, occasionally vulnerable, sometimes really self-assured. Um, Liao met her partner in 2005, and she quickly realized that he did not fit with the conservative ideas that had informed her, her growing up. And her perceived roles, uh, like gender roles, had really began to unravel. And so she took this opportunity to examine their relationship through making photographs. Um, sometimes we see her supporting her partner as he lays across her shoulders or shows them both stripped down um, or maybe he'll be stripped down and she'll be fully clothed. Um, she says that, you know, she really was interested in thinking about gender stereotypes and cliches that we might see um, and how she could sort of create these shared performative acts in front of the camera with her partner. So in taking this really playful approach, she's sort of bucking the classic, you know, 
idea of portraiture and of role models, right? She's portraying herself together with her partner, um, you know, really subverting the traditional role of women and men. Um, the photographs show her partner resting his head on her shoulder at times or being held in her arms and sort of coddled. You know, here on the left hand side, we get this really intimate image where she looks like she's about to whisper into his ear. This image is titled, Some Words Are Just Between Us. And then the image on the right, it's never been easy to carry you, right? There's a variety of ways that we can interpret what this photograph might mean. Okay, the next project we're gonna look at is called Clayton Sisterhood Project. Um, Layla Anna Marie Stevens uh, made this project. Uh, she's exploring sort of the legacy of her sisters and her nieces who are from New York City, but who moved to Clayton, North Carolina on a piece of land together. And she said that she was really inspired by the historical branches um, you know, of people moving, migrating north, and then this sort of idea of re-migration or change migration, reverse migration um, to the south. She also is really interested in the idea of the traditional family album. And as we move through the rest of this talk, I'm going to show you more artists who really try to break apart that idea of the traditional family album. Uh, Stevens utilized the 1960s Black arts movement principle of self-determination to preserve documentation of intergenerational Black women figures across um, these two states of New York and uh, North Carolina. Crossing the boundaries of documentary through a more conceptual approach, this visual preservation of love in its varying forms seeks to ensure the nature of our existence, of our faces, and of our names. Jessica Todd Harper uses portraiture to explore the subtle tensions within uh, daily family interactions and the complexity of human relationships. Her work is grounded in art historical tradition, but with a psychological undercurrent that marks its modernity. You know, she has this really beautiful way of using this sort of subdued light in her work that seems to create an almost ethereal sort of dreamlike setting in all of her images. One of the most satisfying of human experiences is to imagine that the world around us means more than what we see at first glance, that its point uh, you know, is something uh, transcendent. Um, Harper is trying to do just that with her images. Like the 17th century Dutch painter, Johan Vermeer, who imbued ordinary interiors with meaning and beauty, Harper is looking for the worth in everyday moments. Most of the time, Everyday scenes don't mean anything to us. We sort of forget them. But when we scroll through uh, you know, our phones and we sit alone with our thoughts, we're often looking back at our families and our friends and our constructed communities. But sometimes our unexamined or even boring surroundings can be really illuminating to us. They can you know, tell us a lot more as we're looking back upon them. Because this body of work of Harper's spans more than 20 years, Viewers of these photographs get to experience the passage of time in Harper's life. Babies grow into teenagers, grandparents die. In this way, Harper is, sort of alludes to another 17th century Dutch theme, and that is of the memento mori. Uh, life is beautiful and brief, and we need to embrace that. All right, we're kind of running out of time here, so I'm going to skip ahead a couple slides. Uh, I really love Catherine Opie's work here, uh, two self-portraits. Uh, one on the left-hand side is called Cutting. One on the right-hand side is called Self-Portrait Nursing. Um, you can see these images are created about, you know, over 20 years, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, 10 years apart, where Opie in the image on the left is uh, has carved into her back what she wants out of her life. She wants a family, a wife, a child, um, but she is, you know, really concerned about um, what, what queer lives, um, you know, the sort of legislation around queer lives and uh, her life experience. And in the image on the right hand side, we get to see the fulfillment of that dream uh, as she is nursing her son in that beautiful portrait. 
All right. Daniel Colburn's work is another body of work that talks about the sort of destruction of that typical family album. This project is called The Hereditary Estate, and it really, you know, thinks about the flawed ideology of the American dream. Uh, Coburn was frustrated by a lack of images that documented the true and what he saw as troubling nature of his own family history. And he set out to create a new archive. Um, and he, he, what he does is he takes photographs of his own, but he also uses um, altered images that he's found in his family archive to weave together a narrative that he thinks is more realistic um, perhaps a little bit more terrifying, though, than what you would see in a traditional family album. He really carefully thinks about sequencing of these images to create a strong psychological um, experience for the viewer. He does not shy away from turning the lens toward moments of vulnerability, awkwardness, or pain in his family. Uh, many of the images are black and white. Um, some of them are really intimate, while others are really distant. Some of them indicate a sense of closeness, while others show a real detachment from his family. The series is filled with images that come from the, the family archive, as I mentioned. Um, and some of them are manipulated to convey his intended effects, while others are in their original form, and they're just very haunting and sort of foreboding as they are. Um, this addendum to the traditional, as he called it, ideal white heteronormative 20th century family album is filled with traumas and hauntings, but also a desire to tell more of the whole story of a real family. Images of daughters, brothers, aunts, with faces scratched out and distorted light shining on them, you know, really investigates the sort of nucleus of this nuclear family. Speaking about this project, Coburn said, as I became an adult, my parents began to reveal details of a dark family history, the evidence of which had been removed or hidden away in corners of our family sanctuary. Although the specific details of this dark family history are never revealed, Coburn's really piercing portraits of his family members create quiet sort of narratives of personal conflict. But by keeping all these secrets and stories untold, his images remain respectful. They give their, their subjects space when they're needed, and they delve deeper also when needed. All right, I'm going to skip forward to the next artist, although uh, I hate to miss out on Hannah Altman's work. I think we're running a little bit out of time. I'm going to end today with Eleanor Carucci's series, Midlife. Um, this series chronicles a, uh, a journey of, of Eleanor and her family and her passage through aging, through um, changes in her family, through illness, through changes in intimacy with her husband, the relationships with her uh, children um, and her mother. Um, and this really explores uh, what it's like to almost live a, uh, a day, a year, a week, uh, in the life of this particular family. It, this midlife period is universal, right? And at some point, everyone is going to go through this. Um, her project is very moving. It's empathetic and it's portraiture. It shows a point in her life when dramatic change is more important, you know, and more apparent than ever. Um, you know, she continues to make these really immersive and close up examinations of her own life. She's been doing this throughout her career. Um, she had a really beautiful series called Mother, which was about her experience of becoming a mother, uh, everything from really intimate details of her birth um, to, you know, the, the first year of being a new mother and all of the challenges that that entails. Um, she is one of our most, you know, sort of rigorous autobiographical photographers of this generation. And she revisits the same family members over and over again uh, in, over the last sort of two decades. And we see, you know, these great detail shots where maybe we see an up close image of her graying hair or the pressures and joys of marriage through very intimate portraits with her husband. We see episodes of pronounced illnesses, 
um, the evolution of her aging parents and their role as grandparents, as we see here in this image, where we see her in the foreground, her daughter in the middle ground, and her mother in the background, and just this sort of eye contact or lack thereof that we see between the figures. We're really invited to reflect on these experiences and, and sort of share in the challenges of family life and love and, and change. So I'm gonna end there. I wanna thank you for joining us tonight. If you've been enjoying this art history series, please mark your calendars for our next session, which is gonna be on Wednesday, April the 10th at 6.30 p.m. Our topic will be fallout and downwinders. We're gonna be looking at artists who have been inspired by the nuclear age. So thank you so much. And does anybody have any questions before we head off for the evening? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming. All right, I think we can just cut it there and thank you again and to everybody again, please uh, join us for our next series and hope to see you then. Thank you. Okay, take care.